the oldest battle waged in psychology is that of nature versus nurture argument. Similar to which came first, the chicken or the egg, we are asked, does our genetics and biological makeup trump the environments in which we are raised as the most influential over our behaviors? What current research points to is, well, yes, to both sides. This is what gene environment interplay research is all about, finding the connections and correlations between these two different yet related topics. Our genes give us predispositions for certain traits, which are impacted positively or negatively through the interactions we have with the world around us. Likewise, environments can affect our predispositions and heritable genetic code through evolution, toxins, and the current political and societal trends. For example, we might be born with a slower intellectual ability to read. If our parents provide us with warmth and support, possibly even a tutor, we have the chance to overcome that inability. If, unfortunately, we are met with little support, indifference, or anger for being slower at reading, our ability is negatively affected and could result in us forfeiting this skill. That is how genes impact our environment. Yet, our predisposition to slower reading could have been the result of toxins ingested by our mother during pregnancy, for example, through heavy alcoholic drinking or even from drinking unknown contaminated water due to the city changing water sources, not properly purifying the water supply, and corroding the pipes with lead, which kills the chlorine responsible for eliminating parasites and bacteria, as is currently happening in Flint, Michigan. That's how our environment impacts our genes. Researchers measure gene-environment interplay using several quantitative concepts. The first concept is gene-environment correlations under which three categories exist, passive, evocative, and active. Passive correlation refers to the correlation between an environmental measure and a genotype measure. For example, a study researching the genotype of anger being passed from father to son would seek to understand how that anger contributes to their poor parent-child relationship. Evocative correlation refers to the genotype trait of one person affecting the environmental measure of someone typically not related. For example, a study might look at how a wife's genotype for severe depression contributes to her and her husband's non-existent sexual relationship. Active correlation refers to the seeking out of a particular environment due to a predisposition of a certain trait. For example, a young girl may have the predisposition towards being a fast swimmer. So her decision to join her school's swim team and make friends with other athletes is in part due to the result of this trait to swim fast, but it is an active decision on her part to further enhance that trait. The second concept is gene-environment interaction. This concept looks at the degree to which environments and, and genetics impact each other. Spots provides a great example of this. Um, when she said that children with the genetic risk for antisocial behavior placed in adoptive homes with low discord display less antisocial behaviors than those placed in adoptive homes where the mother had a mental illness of depression or where there was high marital discord. This example illustrates that under certain environmental conditions with certain predispositions, a compounded impact can arise. The third concept is non-shared environment. As said in the name, this concept is interested in the non-genetic components that differ between siblings living in the same household. This concept began when researchers took note of differences between monozygotic twins whose DNA are as close to 100% as is genetically possible, yet they had differing characteristics. This concept looks to explore how small and large differences that occur through friendships outside the home, parenting behaviors that affect siblings differently, how each handles trauma, their love interests, their work environments, how all of that comes together to help understand how these environments impact people's behaviors and their predispositions. Similarly, the fourth concept is shared family environment. So Spots noted that a recent meta-analysis found shared environment family life to account for 10 to 30 percent of the variance in children's psychopathology behaviors. 
So variance refers to the effect size, and that tells us that up to a third of children's mental health behaviors are fostered through their upbringing and home life. That's a very important fact to note when we look at their shared family environment. As previously stated, monozygotic twins are quite popular for gene environment interplay research. A major reason deals with the genetic code. In monozygotic or identical twins, almost 100% of their DNA is similar. This means any differences between the two twins are likely caused by environmental influences such as parenting styles, friendships, etc. Dizygotic or fraternal twins, as well as regular siblings, share about 50% of their DNA. This makes teasing apart gene and environmental differences a bit more difficult to do. However, because DNA is different, one can analyze which genes came from which parent and how this increases or reduces predisposition. Another area that researchers compare when looking for shared and non-shared environmental factors is comparing monozygotic twins who live with their birth parents versus those that grow up with adoptive parents. Non-shared environmental factors are easier to identify in twin studies when the twins are raised by their biological parents. Correlations between environments and behavior can be found with higher accuracy. Research that looks at adopted twins can easily differentiate between genetic dispositions and how environments can reduce, eliminate, or increase the impact of behaviors. When it comes to animal studies, Spot stated, an advantage to animal studies is that researchers can randomly vary rearing conditions and other social contexts in ways that they cannot in humans. She goes on to explain that also genes in animals can be manipulated so that we can take out or input bad genes to see what will happen. We can also cross foster genes to see if, for example, combining two genes aids in inhibiting a skin disease from occurring. We'll come back to the implications of animal studies in the slide titled Controversies. In this slide, we'll go over a few studies and their results as it pertains to gene environment interplay. When we look at physical health issues, specifically obesity, a very interesting discovery has surfaced. A gene called FTO has been linked to causing obesity. Studies point out that the FTO gene increases appetite, and when one copy of this gene occurs in someone, an extra 3.5 pounds of weight can be found. If it duplicates a second time, an extra 7 pounds are found. This means that every copy replicated doubles the amount of weight added to the human body. Interestingly, though... When this gene was looked at under a cross-sectional study, which is a study involving numerous people of varying ages measured at one point in time, the findings suggested that this FTO gene was not always a risk factor for obesity. In fact, obesity was only a risk factor in people who held the FTO gene born after World War II, implying some type of environmental influence occurred after World War II that caused this gene to become a risk factor. It is hypothesized that a more sedentary lifestyle and our fast food diet of more fatty, sugary foods, as well as other chemicals that have been added to preserved foods that did not exist prior to World War II likely contributed to the change of this gene. When we look at cancer, studies researching monozygotic twins have found that both twins who harbored the genes for cancer sometimes ended up getting cancer while their twin did not. This was confusing because of their near 100% DNA match. The genes for cancer were found to exhibit an environmental factor that causes activation, deactivation, and dormancy. Knowing that cancer is caused by environmental triggers means pharmaceutical research can concentrate on reversing environmental activations to reverse cancer. And society at large can focus on reducing exposure to these certain environmental causes. The downside is that narrowing environmental factors can be difficult. We know, for example, that skin cancer can be reduced by less exposure to the sun via sunscreen with high SPF counts and staying away from the UV lights of tanning beds. 
Unfortunately, notifying the public has not always led to better prevention practices by the general population. Mental health issues of stress and depression have focused on many family members and twin studies. Spots explored several studies that found when mothers had depression, their children had a 50% chance of a depressive predisposition. Similar findings result for stress. If the father did not have this predisposition, it reduced the likelihood that the children would have it. Environmental factors can moderate effects of predispositions. For example, if a depressed child interacts with his or her mother, their interaction is likely to be interpreted by both as negative. Their corresponding interactions are then flavored by previous negative ones. This represents the negative loop they are stuck in. This pattern has also been identified in couples around stress. Executive functioning in adolescents helps us to understand their ability to self-regulate and their maturation level. However, finding a specific gene related to executive functioning is difficult to do as it relies on various parts of the brain being activated and the amounts of hormones produced. One gene that has been found to correspond with executive functioning is called 5-HTTLPR. This gene has several genotypes that Lee et al. reduced to two categories. The first was for the LL genotype, and the second was for the SL and SS genotypes. These genotypes and the environmental factor of parental supervision were analyzed. Parental supervision was hypothesized as influencing adolescent executive functioning. Results found adolescents with the LL genotype had lower scores of executive functioning and were more influenced by parental supervision. This means only the individuals in their studies with the LL genotype were able to be guided by parental supervision. Lee et al. noted that their findings differed from previous studies which have found SS genotypes to be more influenced by environmental factors. It was hypothesized that perhaps other parental factors, such as warmth, support, and involvement, which were not included in the measures, could be major factors in adolescent executive functioning, more so than parental supervision. Moreover, it was suggested that the 5-HTT LPR gene may be responsible for directing multiple traits not a part of the current study parameters. Overall, this points to the need for further research on more complex gene environment influences and executive functioning in adolescents. When it comes to gene environment interplay and politics, a whole new world opens up to us. Hedema and McDermott wrote that several studies have investigated political attitudes, left-right orientations, social, economic, and defense ideologies, and authoritarianism. These studies have found that genetic influences accounted for a greater proportion of individual differences with direct learning from parents as a minimal proportion. Interestingly, this genetic effect did not influence children's attitudes until they left home. It was not that genes directly affected political attitudes, but genetic dispositions do influence emotive conditions in regards to outgroup members. So stated differently, genes impact how we positively or negatively perceive others who are racially or socioeconomically different or differ from us by gender, disability, sexuality. However, though genes are more influential than learning from our parents, certain environmental factors trigger different emotive processes. For example, depressions and recessions have been shown to trigger different emotive processes within people, especially those who lose their jobs. Similarly, those who live in poverty differ from those with vast quantities of wealth and how they view the other emotionally. Hedema and McDermott further stated that when scientists began exploring homosexuality with gay males, public opinion of gay rights was quite low, with many believing homosexuality to be a choice. Once the discovery of the XQ28 gene on the X chromosomes of heterosexual males was made public, a majority of sentiments began to change as to whether this was biology versus it being a choice. Public opinion began to sway in favor of same-sex rights. Furthermore, 
gay rights were recently challenged within our national Supreme Court with the ruling going in favor of homosexual marriage being the law of the land. Clearly, public opinion for the majority of Americans has changed. Samek et al. looked at parent-child relationship problems and externalizing disorders of antisocial behavior, nicotine dependence, alcohol dependence, and illicit drug use and abuse. The parent-child relationship was found to moderate externalizing behaviors in adolescents age 18, but not in young adults age 25. The results illustrate that the genetic influence of externalizing disorders for adolescents can be modified by parental support and involvement, but for young adults, other environmental factors, such as friends outside the home, can undermine parental factors. In looking at criminality and siblings, Kenrick examines his own life with that of his brother James and that of Whitey Bulger and his brother Billy. Kenrick and Billy became educated men with Kenrick obtaining his Ph.D. and Billy Bulger becoming president of the University of Massachusetts with both their brothers entering the criminal field. Whitey Bulger ended up in Alcatraz and James in Sing Sing. All four men shared with their brothers about 50% of their DNA and likely had the common predisposition for raising one status in the social hierarchy. However, Whitey and James exhibited the predispositions of poor impulse control, high testosterone levels associated with antisocial behavior for individuals from underprivileged backgrounds, and the trait for violence. This was explained as how two brothers from the same family can have markedly different lifestyles, in part due to genetics. Briefly, let's go over some controversies within the field of gene environment interplay. Animal studies allow us to perform tests we wouldn't be able to ethically perform on humans. For example, we can inject viruses and diseases and watch their full effects and either provide an antidote or not for animals. Moreover, we can separate baby animals from their mothers and watch how attachment issues affect the animal later in life with either their mothers during reunification or with peers and possibly other life difficulties that arise. Animal race groups have a huge ethical problem with how we slice and dice the DNA of animals, introducing diseases into their otherwise healthy systems, and the belief that it's inhumane to trifle with their environments and social attachments. Another controversy is that many of the studies discussed involving humans involve children and adolescents. Recently, more attention is being given to adult studies, but the majority of current studies deal with the analysis of children, which means an entire demographic of people are left neglected in this field. A third controversy is gene modification. Genes in nature can mutate, causing birth defects and other problems. However, gene modification has run into problems with being accepted by the general public. Most people think of gene modification as being able to design your baby, picking which eye color it will be born with, or making sure it has predispositions towards athletics. Most scientists are focused on gene modifications to prevent certain gene mutations, possibly like Down syndrome, and certain predispositions to different cancers. Yet public opinion fears we are taking individuality out of people when we begin splicing their genes. Everything I presented today can mean absolutely nothing to you if I can't explain to you why this is important for your daily life or at least for when problems arise within your family. Although therapists cannot check out your heritable traits by drawing DNA and analyzing it there in session, there are many ways in which we can identify your predispositions to certain behaviors by how you interact with each other in session and with us, your therapist. We can highlight those negative interaction loops and help you recognize when you're headed down that rut. And we can teach you techniques designed to get you out of any holes you find yourself in. A great example when thinking about your children's genetic predispositions is to think back to when they were babies. Maybe one slept all the time and perhaps another was fussy and never seemed satisfied. That baby that slept was probably viewed as a good baby. You felt proud to have such an exceptionally quiet child. It made you feel like a great parent. Now think of that colicky baby who was always crying and you could never tell if you were satisfying its needs. You were tired from a lack of sleep maybe even harbored some thoughts of ignoring that baby just so you could have some time to yourself. Perhaps you even followed through on those thoughts. 
You questioned whether or not you were a good parent and if this was going to work out. Given those two babies, which one gets more positive nurturing? Which one will likely have a better parent-child relationship? These moments set up the environmental influences that that baby will have as it grows into a toddler, child, adolescent, and young adult. How we interact with our children also has the reciprocal effect of how they respond and interact with us. Although genes matter, environmental effects have been well documented in twin studies, especially twin adoptive studies, to be impactful and to differentiate ourselves from our biological genes, our siblings, and peers. Moreover, when we think of our spouse or extended family, we know that once we leave our childhood homes, we seek out individuals that possess certain similar beliefs to us, yet enough different ones to make things interesting. Our spouses may share a different upbringing, but share the same political ideology. Or our spouse may agree on how many children they want with us, but we may differ on where exactly we're going to raise them. My stress level affects my spouse, and I'm sure you all can relate to that. How many times have you come home exhausted and then been short with your spouse because he or she neglected to complete a task that you asked them to do? Or it just looked messy in the house and you're like, oh, why am I coming home to this? When that happens, do you think they are happy to get your irritability? Of course not. But if we have that genetic predisposition towards that irritability, it means that we have to be the ones to work harder to not take it out on them because we're only going to upset them more and we're only going to make their life more difficult. The same can be said for our extended family. So where do we go from here? Well, in my next slide, I'll show you how you can further explore this topic on your own time. So I'm sure some of you are wondering, so how can I learn more about this topic and where would I even go to find information on this? Aside from going to your local library and finding out books that might be beneficial for you, to try to find stuff that's a little bit more updated and a little bit more relevant in the field, um, a common Google search can be very useful. And there are lots of different ways that we can use Google um, to find out information. So this next slide is going to be all about showing you how to use Google to find out more about this topic from a variety of sources. So we'll start with the common Google search. When you do a Google search for gene environment interplay, you'll notice that there's an all category, a news category, images, videos, shopping. Um, we're going to go through each of these with you so that you can better understand how to use Google to best find out the most relevant information for gene environment interplay. So we're going to start with a random Google search uh, for gene environment interplay. And once you get into this, it'll show you everything that has ever been written about for gene environment interplay. And as you can see, that can be quite a lot of information. So if we go to the search tools section and then the anytime button, we can custom range our dates so that we end up with the most relevant information um, to go through. And once we're here, we can search all these different websites, all these different articles that come up in correspondence with gene environment interplay. And we can even click in to some of these and find out what the sites offer. So this site offers a bunch of um, related articles. We can go over to the sidebar and see different studies, how they use the theories, what they're looking for. And then we can go back out and we'll start looking at the next category. So now if we click into the news section, you can see that there are all sorts of nature world news and U.S. news and world reports and all sorts of um, sites. If we scroll down, we can see Genome Web, Scientist Blog. So there are all different sorts of news sites that you can find on here. Images are just what it sounds like. It's just pictures and you can click on it and see what's going on. The great thing about the video section is that it's showing you YouTube clips from professionals within our field talking about this topic. So you can get really informed information from here. Likewise, under shopping, you're going to find a lot of information on academic books for gene environment interplay and be able to purchase them. 
That is the overview of a general Google search. However, one problem associated with such a vast search is that even when we narrow the time frame, for example, under news, we see every news outlet in existence that has commented on this topic, which I don't know about you, but I would find that rather overwhelming. So one way that we can eliminate that daunting task is to Google search a specific newspaper outlet. Um, we'll start here with the New York Times. So we'll start by typing the New York Times into the normal Google search. And when we do that, we'll see the actual New York Times appear. And then there's this little results within box that we'll type in gene environment interplay and then click search. And this will give us everything that's ever been written about gene environment interplay within the New York Times. And um, so there's a shortcut that if we want to look up another um, site, um, we can erase the New York Times and put in the Washington Post. And so this is, you would type into regular Google, gene environment interplay, space, site, colon, and then whatever the newspaper might be. And then you can find out all the information within that site specific to this topic, such as obesity and genes. The third and final way I'll show you how to access information about gene environment interplay is through Google Scholar. For those of you who are not familiar with Google Scholar, it is an app within Google that allows you to search through research journal articles. Not every article is free to view. Sometimes you have to pay in order to read. Um, nor is every article from a peer-reviewed journal, so you have to keep that in mind. If you are a student, you can set up Google Scholar to link with your university's library. However, sometimes it doesn't always link properly, so you can use Google Scholar first and then go into your university's library and find the articles within there. At the top right side of Google are little tiles you will want to click on. Then click more, then even more, and that will bring you to Google's main app page. You'll have to scroll down until you find Google Scholar and then click on that. Or you can type Google Scholar into your search bar. I have typed in Gene Environment Interplay, which brings up many PDF files to review for free from several universities. If we narrow the date range, you can see this eliminates some of those free articles. Scrolling down shows you a wide array of topics corresponding with Gene Environment Interplay. For example, our topics of obesity, associations between friend, children and their friends, cancer. Now let's click into one of those free articles. We can read the abstract to see if this article is something we wish to continue reading. You can see that the cited articles are highlighted and hyperlinked so if you wanted to research those for relevancy you easily can just by clicking on them and that's basically Google Scholar.